You can be the best at almost anything. Best stapler ever? Sure. Best impression of Ray Romano? Ah, Deborah, I'm on 90.3 WHPC, yeah! Okay, but only one can be the best radio station on Long Island. And you already know that 90.3 WHPC is the best. Now it's time to tell the rest of the island. The voice of Nassau Community College has been nominated for Best Radio Station in the Beth Page Best of Long Island Awards. And we need your help to be named Best Radio Station on Long Island. You can visit bestoflongisland.com and vote once a day now through December 15th. Please tell your family, friends, and even that neighbor you only sort of like and just say hi to every day to be nice. His vote counts too. Thanks for the help in letting all of Long Island know that we're the best radio station. And thanks for listening to 90.3 W. WHPC. The voice of Nassau Community College. A 2019 Marconi Award finalist from the National Association of Broadcasters. This is 90.3 WHPC. WHPC HD Garden City. Available anytime on your smart speaker. And anywhere on iHeartRadio. WHPC, the voice of Nassau Community College. Welcome to another edition of From the Press Box here every Monday, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. We're part of the WHPC Sports Talk family, which includes Sports Talk Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m., featuring Eric Fischetti. And then also there's another Sports Talk on Tuesday nights, 10 p.m. to midnight. We kick off the week. My name is Rob Leonard. Joining me, of course... Is my brother, and yes, award-winning sports writer Tim Leonard, as we talk sports every Monday. Hello, Timothy. How you doing? Good morning, brother. You were uh, correct about the uh, Jets, uh, the Giants, by the way. Well, uh, it, it, I don't. Not, not, to... not to sound arrogant, brother. When am I not correct? Well, I can name a couple of times, but um, you know, on the show. Oh, okay. Well, then. Maybe a little more than outside the show. You know, I mean, I'm not talking about my entire life. I know I've driving made a couple of mistakes you, here and there. Driving with you is always a adventure. <clears throat> that's that's on you. That's not on me. That's not on me. Not on me. Just take 95 South, that's all. Not on me, bro. Anyway, brother, um, you said back, I don't know if the Giants were 2-2 two and two or whatever. They were 2-2, two and two, brother. And wait, 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 wait. First of all, brother, let's, let's first, before we even kick in, I want to say happy Veterans Day. To all the veterans listening well, out there, I, it's not because today it's, is ve- today is Veterans it's, Day. It's, it's the wrong term. Yeah, all right, maybe it's, happy is not the right word, but but, but we are be, acknowledging the veterans today on Veterans Day. We we should say, and if you see a veteran, everyone says, "Oh, thank you for your work." What you should say is, "I support tax increases to pay for your your job programs and your health care," and and then then you would actually be supporting yes uh, a veteran because everyone says, "Oh, thank you for your service," and you know they're not helping them at all. They just say thank you. And it doesn't really. You see a veteran today. Give him a twenty. Well, she can do that too. But (laughs) but more veterans would appreciate that. More importantly, a a veteran who (laughs) would be appreciative of health care and a job, if they have a problem finding a job, health care they have to have because that's what the VA is all about. So I mean, um, you know, that's yeah. When people say that, you know, it's almost like they're patriotically correct. You know, this politically correct, but then this patriotically correct way. You don't really care what you're saying before. Nice phrasing, brother. Well, I think it's a good phrase. So anyway, um, but uh, wanted to wanted to point that out. It includes includes by the way that includes our uncle uncle Ben Dowdy, yep. retired Air Force. Retired Air Force, yeah. Does not include Cadet Bone Spurs. I'm not going to get into that though. That's a whole other ball game. Yes. Anyway, brother, uh, let's go back. Uh, the Giants were two and two, and you said they're not going to win another game at least until they get to two at eight. Which happened yesterday against the Jets? Yesterday, brother. Yesterday, I I was proven once again to be uh, one of the most sagacious people on sports radio. Now we should say we're going to talk to Andy Vasquez. Yes, yes, we will. Beat writer for who now, brother? The Bergen Record. The Bergen Record. Jets beat writer. The Jets say. beat writer. <clears throat> and uh, so we can talk about the Giants in the beginning. We'll talk about the Jets a little bit later with uh, with Andy. Um, I, I'm not sure what to say about the Giants. <clears throat> Uh, they're bad. They're, they're more than they're bad. They're very bad. They're more than bad. They're more than bad. Well, I mean, how do you get more than bad? 
Because, you're, you're bad. <laughs> because if you change your quarterback and nothing happens, then you should have left your quarterback in. No. Yes. No. Yes. Oh, that's absurd. You're you're, you're giving so Dan- so you're saying you're saying that Eli should be the quarterback. You're you're giving Daniel Jones very bad memories of how what it is to play bad football. Uh, excuse me. He went to Duke. So, so I know I say this a lot as far as basketball team goes, but for football it actually applies. Duke sucks. Yeah. So. So he's already used to losing football. What are you talking about? This is professional. It's a whole other ball game. It's not a whole other ball game. He's been losing for several years. Yeah, I know that. But, you know, there's a lot of players who were great in college and they sucked in the And and how many many rookie quarterbacks come in and win immediately? Or football. It doesn't work that way. It it should. Quarterbacks get drafted high in the draft by bad teams. Those bad teams lose and, and... in in a couple of years, in ho- hope the hope is that they get enough players and get enough enough talented players where they can start to turn things around. But to expect that to happen in Daniel Jones's rookie season, especially when Daniel Jones apparently can't hold on to the football, is a big problem. Never heard a stick like this. Well, he, he needs to he needs to figure it out because two more fumbles yesterday. Can't do that, brother. One one of which Jamal Adams just literally ripped out of his hands and said, Thank you, I'm taking this to the house. Well, that's like the new thing now, I notice, with a lot of. It's, uh, it's not uh, the new thing. Well, it, he to just literally, literally steal the ball it, well, instead of knocking what, it out. That's what Jamal Adams did. He, he just literally went, just went up to Daniel Jones, tore the ball out of his hands, 25 yards. Thank you very much. Just touchdown. Well. And, and, and Jamal Adams also caused another fumble. Before that, I think it was, right. where the only reason that the Jets didn't recover and either get good field position or another touchdown was because the ball just happened to bounce right into Saquon Barkley's hands. It was, it was the dumbest luck I've, I've seen in a long time on a football field. Because at, at first we thought that Daniel Jones knew he was going to be sacked and, and either handed it off or lateraled or something. Right. But the replay showed the ball was knocked out of his hand, went right to Saquon Barkley, who who then wound up losing twelve yards or whatever it was because it was ridiculous. The Jet. Well, I, I'm not going to get too much into the Jets, but but this is how bad the Giants' offensive line was. The Jets came into the game with with I, I believe it was thirteen sacks in seven and uh, no um, eight seven you know eight games. Okay. The Jets had six sacks yesterday. That's way. That's absurd. Too, way too many for the Jets. Absolutely absurd. Yeah, way too many for the Giants to give up. The, Gi- the Giants line, Nate Solder was out with a concussion in the second quarter. They, they, were, they were playing a lot of backups. Still, Jets, the Jets' defense, six sacks, that's insane. Not when, not, when, not when they're averaging barely more than one sack a well, game. Well, the funny thing about it is, brother, that you know, if you had six sacks, you would think this would be the number one team in football. And it's exactly. A, all this, a lot of stats yesterday. I mean, first of all, I, I didn't think either, either team played any kind of defense yesterday. It, it, it was that from that aspect, it, it was it was it was a bad game. I'm sure it was an entertaining game because right. 34 27 tends to be entertaining. And Daniel Jones overall had a good game. He threw for over 300 yards. He had four touchdown passes, two two to Darius Slayton and and two to Golden Tate. By the way, Darius Slayton is for me turning into maybe the best fifth round pick. Definitely the best fifth round pick of, of this draft. Right. One of the best fifth round picks in in probably a decade. This kid is is a player. He can catch a ball. He can do something with a ball when he gets it, and and he is quickly becoming Daniel Jones's favorite receiver. So okay. well, maybe the, the maybe, Giants maybe still maybe need you to have upgrade. to play really bad to find out who your guys are for the next year. Well, the Giants still need to upgrade at receiver, just like the Jets need to upgrade at receiver. But this kid is is, is one for the future. So at least at least something positive came out of this draft because the the, the other two guys the Giants got in the first round. The, the Dexter Lawrence, uh, the the D line guy, and um, what's his name, Baker, the corner. Baker's been a disaster, right. and, and and he he's he he is occasionally showing some signs that he might be worthy of of the first. The Giants traded back into the first round to pick this kid. He he needs to improve in a hurry. Okay. Well, I, you know, it's uh, it's sad for the Giant fans. It's sad for the Jet fans. It's been a sad. Year for football in in New York City, and I think it continues to be said for the rest of the year. It's going to be horrible. I, th- I think I think New Yorkers right now are saying no; those are, those are both Jersey teams. 
Yeah, and and I think the good part about it is if you want to go to a football game cheap, you know, tickets now, maybe ten now, bucks, yeah. fifteen bucks, yeah. maybe. Uh, if if they aren't already, but uh, by this time, by by the next Giants home game, which I believe is Green Bay, they, there's going to be a lot of tickets going cheap. Oh God, yeah. Green Bay's a good team though, so they might not. It might not well, be for that game. Green well, Bay's Green Bay, a lot of Green Bay fans like, are going to pick. There's a lot of Green Bay fans in New York. I, I, I don't know how much they, how much they travel. But, well, but they're in New York. It's like the Steeler fans. They always show yeah, up. Yeah, oh, there'll be a lot of cheeseheads in, in uh, yeah. MetLife Stadium yeah, for that one, be. for sure. But right now, right now, first of all, it, 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 apparently Pat Shermer got a little taste of the hot seat yesterday. Good. Because this game, this game was supposed to be a very winnable game for the Giants. The Jets are coming off a loss to the Dolphins, which I mean, the Dolphins weren't supposed to win a game this year. And they beat the Jets. So the Giants were supposed to be able to beat the Jets based on that. They come out with a loss. Shermer is now 2-8 and eight going into the bye week. This, this isn't working. So, and, and you know, the whole, the whole thing coming into the week was about how, how angry Jet fans are at Gase and they want him out. And he's had, what, eight games or nine games or whatever it is. And they already want him gone because the Jets have been a complete disaster this year. And... Sam Darnold has not made the leap in his second year that some thought he should and or would. So or that's, have to really well, yeah. yeah you sort of have to we, in we, the second we've, year. We've talked about this about how Carson Wentz and Jared Jared Goff both made a, a significant leap in their second years. Although I can say now in in I believe it's their fourth years each, they're both they're both taking steps back this year. So that's not good for either one of them. You you would think they would become established pros by this point. They have both taken significant steps backwards this year. Um, but we we talked about this before that when you have a rookie quarterback and you take a, a quarterback with with a, the number three pick in the draft or the number six pick in the draft, you have a five year window where you need to win in that five year window because you have those quarterbacks on relatively inexpensive. Qu- contracts for quarterbacks so you can use that money to build the rest of your team and to spend it on defense or to spend it on a high ticket wide receiver something else or or to bolster your offensive line the Jets have none of that no no Jets are horrible and the Jets the Jets spent 17 million dollars on a linebacker an inside linebacker which blew the doors off of any inside linebacker what they were making they spent 15 million dollars on Le'Veon Bell who they don't have anybody to block from I watched. I watched every play of that Jets game yesterday. Well, let's let's uh, what's late, yeah, all right, we'll we'll save it for Andy. But even even the Giants, you could say the same thing because Saquon Barkley had his worst, by far, his worst game as a pro. Thirteen carries, one yard. That's horrible. That's that's absurd. How do you get one yard? That means every <clears throat> the other twelve were losses. Shermer combination. Well, you know, he he say. had he had four carries. It seems that way. Four carries for negative yards. His longest his longest rush. Was three yards. Wow. The Jets aren't that good. They're just not. Well, and, and Shermer said after the game that Saquon Barkley was banged up. He he ran into a couple of guys that were holding the yard markers at one point. Whatever he got, he went for X rays after the game. I, I got to believe that 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 high ankle sprain that he had that we said should have had him out for six to eight weeks. He came back after three. He doesn't have the burst that he usually. Saquon Barkley is a guy when he's healthy. He almost doesn't even need a line. He'll find a hole and he'll get through it because he's right. got burst. He's got size, size enough to knock defenders over, and he's got enough burst where he can run away from him after he knocks a guy over. Right. And he's he he had none of that yesterday. Well, I want to get to this before because I know we're going to talk to Andy. Andy, what you guess me, I just want to mention that another team that's two and eight in New York is the New York Knicks. And I have to take back what I st- said about them at the beginning of the season. I said, well, they're playing three good quarters in the last quarter. They're, they're kind of screwing up. They've been, Ever since I said that, they've been horrible. Well, they beat but, Dallas the other night. Yeah, so but, that, but, was, that, it, and that was in Dallas. Yeah, but, a, lot, a lot of people thought that was going to be kind of a springboard. It hasn't. But it, then, it, the springboard was made of cement. La- last, night, last night they played against the Cleveland Cavaliers, who, who are not an especially good team, and got, got hammered at home. I know. Spike it, Lee left early. Well, and Spike maybe Spike had a movie to make or something. No, I don't know. Spike was disgusted, is what it was. And and then and then the clown show came in because 
uh, GM Scott Perry and uh, what's the other one? Um, President Scott Mills. Yes. Steve Mills. Steve Mills. Uh, came in came into the press conference very unexpectedly. But you know what? The, the, if they're if, and I'm not sure how it all works there. And I should say I, I own stock in MSG, and we should say that next year the, the stock splits, and technically you can buy stock in the Knicks and the Rangers and the Hartford Wolf Pack. And but anyway, just to let you know. But if I'm these guys, if I'm the president and the general <laughs> manager, I don't go into the press conference. I do it quietly. Because it brings more focus to the fact that Knicks are losing. And why would you want to do that? You know, I could see well, those, you, know, that, you take a couple of guys to the side and say, hey, man, you know, we know we're not doing well. But we're trying and we're doing this and this. And you, you know it's going to be better understood by the beat writers and the, and the other people covering the team uh, instead of making this giant thing, which is, you know, it's video. It's seen all over the place. It's replayed and replayed. And but replayed. that's the reason, because because then the beat writers will write, well, what is what is Scott Perry doing about this? What is Steve Mills doing about this? They got they got out in front of it. That's that's what yesterday was. I although I, although I will say, and and I, I was I think it's I was, a little too early. Yeah, I, I was talking to my man Matt Cunningham very very early this morning <laughs> about the Knicks and about this this uh, this press conference appearance. And and he hit it. He hit it right. He said, "What's this clown show going on?" And that's what it was. Well, it was a clown because, like I said, number one, it was it was totally unexpected. Right. The, the beat writers are expecting Fizdale to walk in, and all of a sudden, Perry and Mills both walk in. Right. And they're like, "All right, you know what? The the effort and is it, it, is unacceptable, and and we need more consistent effort." And I don't have a problem with them calling for that. I don't have a problem for them calling players out publicly. Because these guys are all making a lot of money, and if you're all if you're a bad team, you you need to get at least at the very I, least give effort. I, one thing about this team though, they're still I think learning how to uh, to pass to each other. And, yeah, play together. I mean, it's, know, the, it, the it, roster they they turned over the majority of the roster. Right. So that to me that means I give them a little more time because you have to. But this, but it, effort effort should be well, there every night. If, that's if, if something you're, else. If you're if you're if you're throwing a pass into the third row because the guy is supposed to be one place, but he winds up cutting a different way. All right, fine. That I can understand. You know that that's something chemistry that needs to build. But you need to play defense and you need to rebound the basketball. You need you need. I mean, everything that's involved with playing together. Right. Fine. I, I don't mind the the mental mistakes, but don't coast. Don't cruise through a game. Don't allow an opposing team that is as as mediocre as the Cleveland Cavaliers to get a thirty point lead on you yep. in, in your own building. Not Come good. on, that's that's just weak. We're gonna take a break right now. We're gonna have Andy Vasquez of the Bergen Record on right after this break to talk about the Jets. Uh, my name is Rob Leonard. He's Tim Leonard. Tim, you're a Twitter at? At Real Tim Leonard. Big news. Now trending. Holy f- Okay, maybe I'm a bit excited. But the voice of Nassau Community College has been nominated to be the best radio station on Long Island in the Beth Page Long Island Awards. You can help us win the award by choosing to vote once a day, every day at bestoflongisland.com. Find us under Arts and Entertainment and click, click, click. Tell your friends and family that we're number one, numero uno, Cream of the crop. You get the point. Thanks for voting and listening to 90.3 WHPC. Saturday Night Fever. Polyester Suits. The Brady Bunch. Bell Bottom Jeans. And the music of the 70s. On the ceiling, if you want me. Join me, Ron Stevens, on the radio Saturday mornings at 7 a.m. for two hours of the decade of Elton John, the Eagles, and disco. Super 70s, the 70s at 7, Saturday mornings on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. 
All hit music. For all those songs radio has forgotten about, join me, Big Ed, Mondays from 10 a.m. till noon for the Good Gold Show. We'll bring back all the great hits of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and more. The sounds of doo-wop to disco, all the Motown, soul, and great rock and roll. We'll even take your requests and dedications to the Good Gold Show. Music. On the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC and streaming on the iHeartRadio app. Tired of your Politica being like this? <laughs> then join the friendly filibuster. Tuesday nights at 7 on 90.3 WHPC. You'll get your politics with a scone and a cup of tea. Hi, Miss Moore. Let's go down to the Cape and discuss the implications of Trump's actions on the porter. Mr. Jimmy, I do believe you're off your rocker. Fellas, I can see that you both have good points, but I agree with the prosecution. You call that a snob accent? Guys, this has gone far enough. Heim, just take us out. Travel with Dynamite Airlines. Flight so comfortable, you're bound to have a blast. Guys! Sorry, wrong script. Join us on the Friendly Filibuster, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHBC. Don't worry, we'll get it right by the time you get here. WHPC. Welcome back to From the Press Box. I'm Rob Leonard. He's Tim Leonard. And we talk sports every Monday. How are we doing today, brother? Doing well, brother. Okay. Extraordinary. As usual. We're going to skip the Jets right now because we can't get Andy on the phone right now. We're working on it. Uh, But we should say, you know, a couple of things here. Um, First of all, the Islanders lost... They were ten. Their ten game winning streak. They lost to the I Penguins. Brother, my brother just tried to call you. Yeah. Okay, brother. Tell me. Yeah. Anyway. Um, anyway, um, it happened, of course, at the Barclays Center, because the Islanders tend to lose at the Barclays Center. Yes, and, brother. And you know they they lost to the Penguins four to three in overtime. Hey, bro. I'll talk Islanders. You I'll, you you I'll, make the phone call. I, Thanks, brother. You know, you should tell me this as you're going along. I just did that. You know, you did. Yeah, I did. Well, let's talk, brother. Talk about Go ahead. Talk about your boring day or something. It's, no, I'll talk Islanders, brother, because the Islanders, the winning streak, the 10-game winning streak, the second longest winning streak in franchise history, uh, was, was torpedoed by the Pittsburgh Penguins. And, and as you said, at the Barclays Center, uh, that was on Thursday night. Brian Rust scored his second goal of the game. He's diabolical. Uh, and the Penguins rallied past the Islanders. The Islanders didn't play well in the third period. They they actually were leading in this game, and they allowed the Penguins to get back in the game. And uh, then they, they scored the goal in overtime, and that was that. So, One thing, brother. What's new about the Barclays Center? Oh, your obsession with the car. The, the Honda car, which was parked in the right it, behind it, the goal from the open, gone. Is, is gone. And my brother was dancing in and, celebration. And, but they didn't really fill the seats with it. So I was very upset with that. Uh, but at least that stupid car isn't there anymore. So Yes, brother. Anyway, Andy Vasquez from the Broken Record is joining us now, brother. There he is. Andy, welcome uh, back to From the Press Box. Of course, Andy is the Jets beat writer for the Broken Record. Welcome back, Andy. How you doing? I'm doing well, guys. Thanks for having me. Um, good to have you on, even though yesterday's game was... Um, wasn't it off well, for the Jets? It was okay. It was yes. entertaining. It was an entertaining game. I, I, how, do you, how do you write about a game like that, which is kind of a... I mean, the Jets won, but it doesn't seem to have been an overpowering win. Oh, man. I mean, I've seen so many bad games this year. That was pretty high on the excitement list, so that was an easy one to write about. <laughs> I mean, you go back and you look at what the Jets were doing against the Browns and against the Eagles and against the Patriots. I, I think they scored no touchdowns in those games. That, that's when it becomes hard to write about, So, or no offensive touchdowns in those games. So, so yeah, yesterday was was relatively easy, and it was a, a weird feeling to walk into a winning locker room after the after the game. I was going to say, any any time you cover a win, 
that that makes it easier because because I, I remember covering some of those Rutgers teams that didn't win at all and 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 I remember that that one time they beat Syracuse and talk about happy I mean just overjoyed and I, I I'm sure the Jets locker room wasn't quite like that yesterday but I'm sure everybody obviously had a smile on their face and you know w- was all happy to talk to any reporter who was crossing by his locker. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it was a different vibe, and you could tell. I mean, they weren't celebrating like they had accomplished anything because they haven't. They're they're two and seven, but right. anytime you go through a stretch like they'd gone through, and and most of the guys in that locker room, anyone but he was here with the team last year, they had lost sixteen of eighteen to head again to yesterday. So yeah, it was it was gloomy as as uh, Kelvin Beecham told me after the game. He said it was gloomy in Florham Park, and this will help it for a week at least. As, you know, obviously they got to keep it going against the Redskins next week, but it, it takes the heat off of everybody for a week. And that's, you know, what a team like this, they, they, that's what they needed. They needed to just be able to move past that Dolphins win or that Dolphins loss. And, and only, it only sat there for a week, and now they can kind of move on with their season. How, how important was this because of the, these, these storm clouds that have been gathering around Adam Gase? How important was this win to kind of quiet that down? And because I mean, I think anybody with any kind of rational thought knows the Gase isn't going to get fired halfway through his first season. But how big was this win to maybe quiet some of those people down? I, I mean, I think it helps from in terms of lessening the outside noise, I guess. And I think it helps take the ammunition from some of those people. But like you said. It was unreasonable. I mean, no coach has ever been fired that quickly in the history of the NFL uh, for win-loss reasons. I don't think any coach has ever been fired that quickly overall. So and it wasn't going to happen because, you know, the Jets have basically staked their whole future on this. So I think it just gives him a little bit more space and time to work without taking a bunch of heat. But I don't. It's it wasn't going to happen. So I, it's hard to mesh that in terms of how important it was. Um, and, it, and I don't think it fully takes them off the hot seat because if they go to Washington against that team and lose on Sunday, it's all all the the nonsense is going to come right back. Yeah, but that's true. I, I think what it does what it does do is shows that the team is still playing for him because you know they they showed up yesterday. They, and I don't think playing hard has been an issue. They just make a lot of really bad mistakes and they have a lot of depth issues and and. He's also been out coached on a couple of occasions, which is not encouraging. But I, I think what matters is how they build off of this. And, and they have another winnable game on Sunday. And, and how do they look then? Do they look like the team that couldn't do anything right against Miami? Or do they look like the team that strung together some nice plays, some, some nice sequences against the Giants? We're talking with Andy Vasquez. He is the Jets beat writer for the Bergen record. I got a question about Sam Darnold. One thing that got me a couple of weeks ago with the seeing ghosts thing, the thing that got me about that, if if you look into the lights the wrong way, you will see in your eyes shadows. And I was wondering if that's what he was talking about or was it the medication he might be on? But, no, I'm serious because if you're if the lights are set up wrong in any uh, place you're playing and you're looking at it too much, your, your eyes are going to hurt. And your eyes are going to have, you know, certain shadows around. I was wondering if that had anything to do with it. And how do you think Sam Darnold's doing? Is he the is he the next Mark Sanchez or is he the next uh, Joe Namath? Well, not Joe Namath. I won't say that, but we'll say uh, Richard Todd. Chad, Great. Well, I, Chad I think Pennington. The, the seeing, the Chad seeing Pennington. Ghost, that's better. <laughs> we'll get to that one in a second. I think the seeing ghost thing. I think it's a common term that that quarterbacks have used when. Things aren't going right, and basically they're not feeling the, the pressure. And he obviously was not feeling the pressure that night because it was coming from every direction, and he was confused, and the offensive line was confused. And I don't think it was as much of an indication of him admitting that – I mean, it was, it was an admission that he was a little overwhelmed, but I don't think it was like, you know, I'm losing it here, I'm freaking out. It, it was just – in his mind, it was a pretty normal thing that was said, and Maybe that's the reason it made it to air because whoever was listening to the comments thought it was relatively normal, and then the internet, as it does in this day and age, kind of took it and ran with it. But I, I think that was a, that turned into a much bigger deal than it really was. Um, he had a terrible game, and and that's what it was. I mean, there's literally nothing good that came of that of that game. But 
Um, I mean, I think with Darnold, when you look at what he had done going into the Giants game, the the issue was turnovers. He had ten turn or nine turnovers in those three games before, starting with the Patriots game, eight interceptions, uh, and a lot of them had been just these baffling decisions that you don't want your quarterback making, and that you can't have your quarterback making because these decisions are, are crippling, and they they. They rob the the offensive confidence. They fresh. They make the defense's job harder, and and just not capitalizing on opportunities. I think he had thrown several of those interceptions in the red zone. So, um, what the most encouraging thing about yesterday was is that Darnold didn't have this dazzling game, but he did everything he needed to do uh, for them to win the game. And he was put in some of those same tough positions where he could have made poor decisions. Again, and he and he didn't. He didn't in those situations. He didn't make poor decisions. So that to me is when you're you're talking about Sam Darnold. Is he a franchise quarterback? Whether that's what level that's on, we'll find out in years to come. But if he's ever going to be that long-term guy who can take the Jets to where they need to go, those huge mistakes have to be eliminated. And he did it yesterday. And now, again, it's about stacking that and seeing going forward, can he put together a run here where he doesn't make these crippling mistakes? That's going to be the difference between him being, you know, just another guy or being a guy who has some staying power and can and lead the Jets to the playoffs and, and who knows where else. In, in terms of Darnold, um, obviously the, the mono hasn't been helpful for him this season, um, and, and he, he's had, uh, you know, some issues – but Adam Gase was hired essentially to turn him into the quarterback that the Jets, you know, the franchise quarterback that the Jets wanted when they drafted him. Um, how do you think that development is going this season? And, and you know, what's what's the what's the chemistry like between them? And I, I know I know Darnold has was quoted in a paper today as saying you know, he he likes Gase and and he 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 doesn't see why there was any reason why you know why he might be let go but has Gase had that much of a positive impact on Darnold's play on the field I mean for the same reason why it's too early to say that Gase should be fired it's it's even earlier in the process with Darnold because yesterday was only his sixth game right. under Gase and you have to wonder how much did the mono affect Darnold week one I mean he hadn't gotten fully sick yet but he was not right and and how much did it has it affected in the last couple of weeks? And not maybe in terms of how he's feeling physically, but you know, missing that time. He came back and looked great against the Cowboys, but then looked completely lost in the next game against the Patriots. And how much of that is Darnold learning a new offense and and going through some inevitable growing pains that now that he missed three games, some of them are happening later in the, in the season than maybe people would have expected them to. So. I think the verdict is very much still out or the jury is still very much out on, on how it's going, but there there are some signs of promise. And this week, Donald said, or before the game, Donald said that he was getting more comfortable in the offense. Gase said that he's taking more ownership, telling Gase what he likes, what he doesn't, what he's comfortable with, what he's not. And they went out and had that mistake free game that they needed now it's can they start hitting the, the big explosive plays? And it's also, let's be honest, it's hard to judge the progress of Darnold because of the offensive line in front of him. I mean, he's, this guy's getting hammered every game, has uh, virtually no time to throw. Mm-hmm. He only got sacked twice yesterday, so that so they did a good job of getting the ball out quicker and putting him in positions where he wasn't taking that punishment. But against better defensive lines and better defenses, uh, it's going to be tougher and, and Washington is certainly a better defense than the Giants' defense, so that'll be a nice test for him moving forward. But, yeah, overall, I think it's too early to tell. There are some signs. There are some extenuating circumstances. Um, but let's see how he looks after 10, 12 games in this offense. Well, that was an, another question I wanted to talk about was just the offensive line. Obviously, it is not good, and, and obviously changes need to be made. I mean, I I, you, I saw Le'Veon Bell's stats yesterday, and I couldn't believe, you know, coming into the game he had 415 yards. Uh, yeah. How much of a disaster has the line been, and and how 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 critical do they need to make, or you know, how how critical is it that they make changes for next season? Well, I mean, it's 
the line when it was healthy going into the season was a, a question mark and a weakness. And then by the end of yesterday's game, you only had one starter left from that line, Kelvin mm-hmm. Beecham. Everybody else has either been injured or benched. So, I mean, that just tells you a bad offensive line now with only one of its five starters. That I mean, that that's a difficult situation. There's a very good chance that next year the Jets will have five new starters, five different guys than we saw start this year on the offensive line. It, it's It's the most important thing the Jets need to do, and I think, you know, Joe Douglas, the new general manager, knows that when he came in earlier this year, um, when he was hired in June, he said, my priority is, you know, we have a quarterback and now I have to have strong offensive line play and defensive line play. That's what championship teams are built on. And even after trading Leonard Williams, the Jets have a pretty strong defensive line. They, they, they believe it or not, lead the league in uh, yards per carry rushing. They have, they have the lowest yards per carry rushing against. Uh, but the offensive line is a complete disaster, and that's going to be Joe Douglas's biggest thing going forward is, is putting these guys in front of Darnold that can protect him and, and you know make his life easier because it's that's a huge part of it. It's just a really difficult situation when you go up against elite defenses that can confuse you with, with blitzes and the Jets have no chance to pick them up. And then Darnold you know, has to scramble back there, and, that, and that's why he was seeing ghosts against the Patriots. Yeah, and obviously, like you said, you want to keep him upright and, and not have him taking all of those hits. Um, I, I got to ask you, because obviously you've been covering this team every day for, for several years now. I, I need an explanation on, on this whole dynamic between Christopher Johnson and Gase and, and now Joe Douglas. Um, in your opinion, why did Johnson give Gase – so much power before he'd even coached a game for the Jets. And tell me what other franchise would, would in effect, have the coach hiring the GM, which is basically what happened because Joe Douglas is, is a is a Gase confidant. Uh, but what what does Johnson see in Gase that, that so many others seem to be missing? Well, I would say this first about Gase. Like, say, the public, the guy you see in press conferences, especially after games, it's not – really representative of, of what he's like to be around. He, he is like, uh, it's hard, hard to, how do I explain this? He, he has like a, a charisma about him. And he's a likable guy. You, you may not see it. It may not come through the television cameras, but you know, he's a likable guy who, who has strong opinions about how to run an offense and, and does a good job of selling them, especially behind closed doors. Uh, maybe not the best press conference guy, but he's, you know, he's a thoughtful guy and insightful guy and, there, there's more charm there than um, you might expect. And, okay. and I think that's part of it. Um, as for the whole power structure and, and why I think, and why Gase got that amount of power, I think the Jets would say he didn't, that he was just a factor in the hiring. I don't know if that's true. I think he had obviously a huge say and, and they wanted to bring in a guy that meshed with him. And I think that's it. I mean, I think they had had, you know, the arranged marriages before with Rex, and Idzik, and then with Todd Bowles and and Mike McCagnan, and I think they wanted two guys who were going to work well together. So that that's part of it. Um, and obviously, the arranged marriage between McCagnan and Gase that that blew up spectacularly and quickly. Yes. So I think they wanted two guys who were going to work well together. I, I still don't love the way the power structure is set up, where the GM and the coach uh, have equal power and and promote or a report directly to the owner. I think, you know, when things start going bad, that pits those guys against each other and can work against the best interests of the franchise because those guys will be doing things that are in the best interest of saving their, their jobs, not in the best interest of the franchise. So I think, yeah. you know, as years go on, that's that's a tough power structure. But, I mean, I don't have a great answer for why Johnson believes that much in Gase, especially given his – his record in Miami, but I will say that he is more convincing and better at selling his ideas kind of um, in more intimate situations than he might be in, in the press conference. Okay. Yeah. Cause I saw the press conference yesterday and it was, you know, I, I, I just, I was yeah. left watching that and saying like, what is wrong with this guy? <laughs> Basically is what it came well, down to. You just won a game. He, he should be pretty happy about it. And, and, and it was almost, it was almost like, it was almost like Belichick. 
I mean, I, I don't you know, know if that's his role model for these press conferences or what, but I, I just expected something else from him a little bit more. I would watch him more on like a Wednesday or Thursday when, and he'll go into depth on answers. He's just never going to give you much after a game because I don't think his mind is, is quite there. Okay. Uh, and, and I think it's also part of this. If you watch him after losses, he's generally not a guy who's going to be overly frustrated. I think it's part of like a larger message he's trying to send to the team. I, I, he, you know, Le'Veon Bell said that after the game yesterday, you know, was Gates happy in the locker room? Sure, he was happy, but it wasn't like this relieved guy who's like, oh my God, I just saved my job. It was, I'm happy, but now like, okay, it's on to next week and let's, you know, enjoy your day off or whatever and, and then let's get back to work. So I think that's part of that persona. He's just kind of, you know, he's a, obviously he comes across weird socially in those settings. And, and so I think that's most of what you're seeing in, in those press conferences. So he wasn't like the Minnesota coach diving into his players. And <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't think you're going to see that from Adam Gates, at least not, not publicly. Okay. <laughs> We're talking with Andy Vasquez, the Jets beat writer for the broken record. How do you uh, look at the rest of the season for the Jets? What, what are you looking for as a writer? And also what are you looking for just as an observer of the team in the sense, will they get better? You know, yeah, I mean, it's nothing has changed. I, I mean, I know this team had high expectations and wanted to contend for a playoff spot, and some fans did too. But that was never what this year was about. This year has always been about is Sam Darnold finishing the season in a position where you can be like, okay, we're ready to take this next step with him in 2020 and, and, and go for it. And that's all that still matters. That's all these last seven games are about. Is Darnold going to use Sunday's performance against the Giants as a launching pad or another nice finish to the season like he had last year, the, the kind of finish that had everybody really excited about his future, or is he going to take steps back? Because if he if he has a horrible final seven games of the year or, or you're not certain that he's ahead of where he was at this time last year, that's when – that's, I think, when the when the organization has to take a serious look at Gase and if he's the right guy, because that's all that matters going forward is, is where this kid can take you. So that's the biggest thing I'm looking for at the end of the season. I mean, like, what does he look like? Does he stop making these mistakes? Does he show he's capable of, of, of carrying the Jets, you know, beyond what they are? I don't think the wins and losses matter that much, but – if you look at the schedule, I mean, they have a lot of easy games coming up. You know, they play the Redskins, they play the Bengals, they play the Dolphins again. You yeah, know, and, the and win, the winless Bengals and the one win Dolphins. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a team that yeah. really should be able to get Redskins. five wins at the minimum. Yeah, you, you would you would think so. Uh, but if Donald comes out and looks great and and they don't win five games because their defense gets torched because they're playing Bless Austin and. Arthur Mollett at cornerback, and they're on to their sixth and seventh inside linebackers. Right. You know, I don't think Jets fans should be angry. You know, I, I think that's what you've got to watch first and foremost is understand the situations that Arnold in with his offensive line and then try to evaluate where he's at after this year, and, and that's the most important thing. But, yeah, they could, win, they could win five or six games for sure. They could easily win those three games and then beat a team they're not supposed to, like the Steelers or – or the Bills. I, I don't think they're going to uh, – I don't gonna, see them beating the Ravens. They're, they're not going to beat the Steelers. They might be able to beat the Bills. They won't yeah. beat the Steelers. The Steelers I mean, were yeah, impressive you never yesterday. Know. We, yeah, yeah, you're probably right. So, But weird things happen in the NFL every day, um, and, and you never know. But I would like to see them play well against the teams that they should beat um, and, and then – just see Darnold play well. That's really all that, all that matters. That's the thing I'm looking for most at the end of the season. Just in terms of, you have to assume that the Jets are going to have another relatively high pick at the end of the season. Where do you see them going with that pick? Uh, if, if you're Joe Douglas, are, are you are you going O line? Are you going for a number one receiver? Are you going D line? I mean, what what do you see as, as the 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 biggest need that needs to be addressed in the draft? The biggest need is clearly the offensive line, but it's it's going to depend on value and what's there. Like this, this draft is, is really deep with receivers. And if the jets are picking 
in the, you know at, at some point early in the first round it may make sense for them to to go with the kind of weapon they can give Donald and and maybe look for offensive line later uh, or it may make sense for them to trade down and take a receiver and an offensive lineman at the end of the first round it depends on where they're sitting I mean if they're sitting at three and there's three great quarterbacks in this class that people are going to trade up for then you see them trading down. That that would almost be an ideal situation. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because then they that could would really maximize things. Where they want to be. But I think a two wins is going to be hard to be that high in the draft. So it, yeah. it all depends on where they are. But, I mean, their biggest need is clearly offensive line and cornerback. But it depends on where they're picking in the in the draft. And that's the biggest thing. Uh, you know, what's available? What's the value? Uh, what can they get? I I think, ideally, they'd like to come out of those first two rounds with, with a weapon and somebody they can build around on the offensive line. Mm-hmm. Too bad they just can't call Nick Saban and just say, send, send us your three receivers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that would work. Pretty impressive, <laughs> man. That would be. What a, what a performance. I mean, those, those guys, they make Tua's job look, look pretty easy, I think. Very true. Yeah. Um, we got time for one more question. I'm looking at looking at my list here. I'm 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 going going for the big question. Um, let's see. I'm just I'm just going to ask you. Just do you do you see yesterday's win as the first step in a turnaround, or or is that is that too premature? Sam Donald yesterday said, um, you know, we still believe. You know, we we know that if we win out, we can make the playoffs. Which, playoffs, A's playoffs, A's. which is yeah, he he did say that. And look, first of all, people are going to make fun of him. Whatever, like, wh- why would you make fun of him? What else do you want your hyper competitive twenty two year old franchise quarterback saying? Yeah. Like, what do you want him thinking? Like the season's over. I mean, the season's over, but you can make fun of him. But but it's good that it's good that he says, says that, and that's what he's thinking be. about. Yeah, he should. But but no, they have no chance of making the playoffs. I mean, they're starting Arthur Mallet. And bless Austin at cornerback. They have, you know, they have an offensive line that's a disaster, and you know their their defense is a mess at inside linebacker. They just the roster isn't good enough to make that kind of a run. Right. Uh, but yeah, sure they can win like four out of the final seven games or something like that and get to six wins, and everybody can feel good about this year. That can happen. But no, I don't think this is like. I don't think you're going to look back on this as some great turnaround, but you could look back on this as, yeah, this is where they stabilized things and kind of got their feet under them and started building, if, if they are to go on and do that. I, yeah, this, depends, this, this is where know, Sam Darnold really started to get it, that yeah. that kind of, you know. I but can, you're going to know that. that by Sunday, man. Like, right. if they come out and lose to the Redskins, then that was a blip on the radar and – Whatever they do next is either going to be their turnaround or this is going to be the begin. You know, you'll look back at the Patriots game probably as like that's where it all went wrong. So, right. Um, we won't know until Sunday, but I think if they win on Sunday, that's a game they they should win. They have enough talent. They're better. They're a better team than Washington. If they do that, then you can start to say, okay, yeah, things are headed in the right direction. And if they lose to Oakland, Oakland's a better team than them. So what? Um, but yeah, if they if they beat two teams that they should have beaten in a row after a brutal loss to another team they should have beaten, then I think you can feel good about the direction of where things are going. Yes. Well, Andy, we thank you for joining us here on From the Press Box. We've been talking with Andy Vasquez. He is the Jets beat writer for the Bergen record. And uh, we'll talk to you hopefully before the season's over. We appreciate you coming on our show. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jazz. Thanks, Thanks, Andy. Great stuff. And if you want to check out his stuff, uh, what is it, uh, NorthJersey.com? NorthJersey.com. If you want to read some of Andy's articles. Click on Jets. You click on the Jets. Uh, you're listening. And he, he also covers a lot of golf, too. But Okay. Well, you're listening to From the Press Box. We're going to take a break and talk about soccer right after this. You can be the best at almost anything. Best stapler ever? Sure. Best impression of Ray Romano? Ah, Debra. I'm on 90.3 WHBC. Yeah. Okay. But only one can be the best radio station on Long Island. And you already know that 90.3 WHPC is the best. Now it's time to tell the rest of the island. 
The voice of Nassau Community College has been nominated for Best Radio Station in the Beth Page Best of Long Island Awards. And we need your help to be named Best Radio Station on Long Island. You can visit bestoflongisland.com and vote once a day now through December 15th. Please tell your family, friends, and even that neighbor you only sort of like and just say hi to every day to be nice. His vote counts too. Thanks for the help in letting all of Long Island know that we're the best radio station. And thanks for listening to 90.3 W. UHPC. A Super Bowl champion, U.S. congressman, publisher of Long Island Business News, award-winning authors, physical fitness life coach, and celebrities like Billy Crystal and Eddie Murphy? I had no idea so many awesome people got their start at Nassau Community College. Located on 225 acres in Garden City, Long Island, Nassau Community College, a member of the State University of New York System, has close to 20,000 students attend the school each year. The college mascot is Leo the Lion, and Lion Tales are his stories of the school's absolute best best and brightest who have graduated over the past 50 plus years. Hosted by Aurora Workman, the president of Nassau Community College Alumni Association, and Dr. Linda Nadian, a proud Nassau graduate. Let's catch up together as the Alumni Association of Nassau Community College proudly presents Lion Tales, a Nassau Community College Foundation production. Listen every Monday afternoon at 3.30 on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. We're back here on From the Press Box. I'm Rob Leonard. He is who? Or what's your name, brother? Phil Tim Leonard. Okay. How do you check. forget your brother's name? I don't forget my brother's name. I'm just wanting you to say your name, you know, so you say it instead just of me. Introduce me, brother. Anyway, he's award-winning sports writer, Tim Leonard. Anyway, yeah. just as a reminder, don't forget about Rock Overdose. Tuesday through Fridays at 2 p.m., you can never truly overdose on rock music. Listen to classic rock from the 60s to the 90s and call in your request, too. That's the Rock Overdose, Tuesday through Friday, 2 p.m., right here at 90.3 WHPC. 62 to 90, so they play, they play the arm. They, I'm sure they could. Nice. I doubt they would, but, you know. Anyway, uh, we should say that the MLS listened to Rob Leonard again a, a se- <laughs> two times two times in one show. <laughs> someone has listened to me oh, in, in the man. sports world. The Islanders got rid of that stupid car parked next oh, to the glass. Thank God we don't have to Barclays hear about Center. it anymore. Today is the last time we're going to hear about that car. And, um, I'm maybe, so happy. Maybe. And, uh, of course, uh, I've been angry at the MLS people for thinking that people want to watch soccer, uh, guys running around in shorts in the snow in cold weather. Uh, so they ended it. They ended their season on November 10th instead of in December 10th, we'll say. This was, you know, this goes back to last year, brother. Right, after last year. Remember, I complained about it, and they listened to me, and they said, oh, we should listen to Rob. Let's listen to Rob. So anyway, the Seattle Sounders, who are turning into a MLS... Um, eh, don't overreact. Do you don't think they're becoming a dynasty team? Eh, not yet. Okay. Two, two championships in four years. Toronto FC... If I'm remembering correctly, was the champion last year. So, I mean, you could yeah. call them a dynasty well, a little bit as really. well because they reached the championship game. Maybe. But anyway, the Seattle Sounders defeated Toronto FC. Please get yourself a real name. That is Three real to name. one, that's not a real name. It is. Uh, to win the MLS Cup in Seattle, it was packed in Seattle. It was crowded yep. and noisy, and there was a lot of drunk singing, um, which <laughs> happens at these games. No, seriously. <laughs> what, what do you mean? Uh, I'm just enjoying your recap of the game, brother. Anyway, um, <laughs> Anyway, there was, you know, there, there was a. I felt bad. It didn't matter because uh, the Sounders won three to one. But right. the, the first goal bounced off a defenseman's leg. Yeah, it was a deflection. Kelvin yeah. Kelvin Leardim Thank was uh, was the, the player who scored that goal for Seattle and in the fifty seventh minute after a scoreless first half. And I was like, I feel bad for this guy. What if they they lose one to nothing? It reminded me when I was a little kid. Um, I was in twelfth grade and went John J. Burns Park watching uh, the the midgets play. You know, like okay. the seven year old kids, right? And you know, you know, they can't play. They they, they can barely they're, run. They're small people. And, and so this guy is on the goal line, and he goes to kick the ball because it's coming to him, and he totally missed it. It went in the net, and the game was over. And I wonder if this kid, you know, thirty five years later, still carries that with him that he went to kick the ball and it, he missed it and it went under his leg and it went in. Laces out, brother. I guess laces out. I, I was I was just, <laughs> but I thought of the guy bouncing off his leg. I'm, I'm saying, well, it's it's not his fault. These things happen. I know, it's but it, it did happen. But uh, anyway, so it was it was nice to see the game. was game was on Channel 7 on ABC. Big network. Nice to see MLS getting some coverage. Um, Let, let's give some credit. Victor Rodriguez, 
was uh, was the player who scored what proved to be the winning goal that right. came in the seventy sixth minute. Caused uh, caused Sounders super fan Chrissy Teigen to run around her house in celebration. I saw that on Twitter. Impressively, she did not spill one drop of her drink. I was oh, very I'm, impressed I'm by impressed that. Impressed by that. Well done, yeah. Chrissy. Um, Raul Rui Diaz scored in the 90th minute for Seattle to, to give them a 3 nothing lead. And then uh, U.S. national Josie Altidore uh, pulled one back in stoppage time, spoiled the clean sheet. But Nice head ball. I, 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 don't, I don't think the Sounders really cared. No, but it was beautiful head ball. I mean, That's can, what Josie does. Yeah, it was right next to it. and um, Former you know, Red Bull Josie Altidore. I, and I'm also glad one thing that uh, the Seattle Sounders uh, took their NASL name uh, like the Portland Timbers, yes, and I know that the you love the history. I love the history, so I'm glad the Sounders uh, won. I was very happy about that. We should say, also, my team Liverpool uh, defeated Manchester City, or Man City, as the as the kids call them. As the kids call them, <laughs> and uh, they might, might have locked up the title, brother. Week twelve in in the Premier League, and Liverpool might have locked up the title already. That's incredible. They are eight points ahead of second place Leicester. Not second place Man City, second place Leicester, and and eight points also ahead of third place Chelsea. Not third place Man City. Man City has dropped all the way to fourth place now. The, they, that, Liverpool is nine points ahead of them. Doesn't that make you happy, brother? No, not really. Oh. I, Tottenham is in like 12th place or something, so I'm not happy about oh, any okay. of it right now. But Liverpool has won 11 of their first 12 matches. They have 34 points out of 36 so wow. they are they are in American terms they are eleven zero and one in British terms they are eleven one and zero because they they do wins draws losses, uh, but uh, you know Liverpool right now I tell you what Liverpool got a break yesterday because one of their guys should have gotten whistled for a handball uh, I think it was uh, uh, Trent Alexander Arnold uh, and there was no call and I don't know why there was no call because Tottenham got screwed in the Champions League final when one of the Liverpool players kicked the ball at Musa Sissoko. The ball hit him like in in the, the area where the chest and, and right. the arm come right, together. Right, right. He got called for a, for a handball two minutes into the game. That was the whole game right there. This one, the ball hits the Liverpool player in the arm. No call. I don't know what's going on. Well, Ridiculous. That's but uh, part uh, of the deal, bro. That's uh, that's the kind I, of gifts I'm, that the referees give you when your team is good. I well, guess. Well, I, I, I'm always disappointed when they call a handball when it's kicked at the guy. It's not like he stuck his hand out. Well, it, I mean, if his, if his arm is out like that, then I can understand it. But you know, when when you when you kick the ball at the player and and you're five feet away from him and he can't react and the ball hits him in the arm, that's not a handball. No, it's not. No. So you know, it is what it is. But uh, so that's uh, that's a soccer weekend. Great, great weekend for MLS. Big crowd, yeah. like you said. Oh, big very, network. Very, you know. uh, entertaining game. You, you know something. All good stuff. If, if I, I wish I can run MLS. <laughs> First of all, there would be no FC names. Oh my god! Second of all, you know they had uh, Audi was their main sponsor for the Audi, at least in the good, second. Good sponsor. They, they, they like they, soccer. They had it above the scorecard there on yeah. the screen, and it was getting lost in the crowd. So it said this. I think it said something like this quarter or this half is this half sponsored yeah. by Audi, and you couldn't see it half the time. And you want to see it if you're Audi because you want your thing to be there. Yeah, everybody knows. And I thought there was a little. Um, I don't know if you're going to do that. Do do it right, and you know what? I mean, I don't know how many people were uh, in Sounder Country, but a lot. A, that was a noisy crowd. Yeah, that's what they do up there in the Pacific Northwest. Great, great section of the country for MLS. But yeah, they love. Port, they love. Portland is the is the same way as Seattle. Yeah, they are. So, um, anyway, let me hit you with a couple things, brother. Hurry baseball up, bro. related. Uh, the New York Yankees have hired Matt Blake as their new pitching coach. Okay, uh, he was one of the. Uh, one of the key cogs in the Cleveland Indians pitching development machine. Yeah, I stole that from ESPN. Uh, he's going to okay. replace longtime coach Larry Rothschild. Uh, and uh, the Yankees also interviewed David Cohn for the job, but he didn't get it. Um, National League Rookie of the Year will be announced today. From the press box has learned that Pete Alonso will win the award. How did we find out? So bro? that's that's an who, exclusive. Who, who, who did we call? That uh, you know, I have my sources, brother. Oh, okay. Uh, Braves pitcher Mike Soroka, Padres shortstop Fernando Tatis Jr. also have been nominated. Uh, Manager of the year will be announced in both leagues tomorrow. Yankee skipper Aaron Boone would be a strong candidate to win that award. I agree with that. Cy Young Award is will be announced on Wednesday. Mets ace Jacob Degrom is a strong candidate Should to win, win his second Should straight award. And, and then the MVP awards in baseball will be announced on Thursday. And why, why aren't they doing something about the Hall of Fame too? Uh, that comes later. That comes down in December. Oh, okay. Cause That's uh, uh, Mattingly and Munson are going to be considered in the uh, in the Veterans Committee 
new. It's a kind of a newfangled vote that they have going yeah, on. Yeah, I know that they're trying to make it so guys like Munson and Mattingly can get in because they deserve it. So. And and I'm a Met fan, and I th- um, if I had a vote, I'd vote for both of them. So I uh, I I think both of them were dominant players of their time. They had obvious difference not differences but things happened in longevity was an issue for both of them yeah, obviously you know, one was a plane crash one was a really bad back yeah and so you know Donnie so, baseball trying to help his case with yep. his with a managing career although managing the Marlins doesn't really help but right and you know that you know Joe Torre you know was the same uh, another way. one he, he, same way he 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 should have been in as a player's batting 298 and then they said, "Well, okay. Well, oh, oh you can't. You won what? Four, four, World four Series. World Series, brother. That'll that'll help you get into World yeah, Series. Yeah, that will. Anyway, uh, thank Big you, Ed, brother. Big Ed agrees. I see him nodding. Yeah. Big, Big Ed's ready. He's a uh, he's 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 prepared to do the greatest radio show you've ever heard in your lifetime. It's called Good Gold. It's oldies that no one plays anymore. Ed's Ed's like the, one of the few people who play these oldies, and they're, they're they're all songs you know and love. They're not like they're crap songs." <laughs> They're good songs. So anyway, I'm Rob Leonard. He's award-winning sports writer. Tim Leonard. Oh, right. Tim, <laughs> why can't you do this? Why are you incapable because of doing this? Because I want this? you to say your name, and not don't me. Say, you say it. You, you, when you're going through it, don't just stop. You're not even pointing at me or anything. It's like, how am I supposed to know that you're just going to stop? Okay, okay. Anyway, You're, you're like care. a bad driver. You're oh, speaking stopping, of bad, Stopping in the middle speak, of the road. Speaking of bad driving. I have a whole bunch of stories. Ugh. Anyway, Big Ed's coming up next. Listen to him and, and be happy. The views expressed on air are not necessarily those of WHPC, its management, or Nassau Community College. Responsible opposing viewpoints will be considered by emailing them to whpc at ncc.edu or by mail at whpc One Education Drive, Garden City, New York, 115. Thanks for listening to the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.